All who are able, please stand and join us in our call to worship. We gather. People of faith. And no faith. People of hope. And no hope. People of peace. And no peace. We gather with the longing to be made whole again, if just for this time, here and now. We gather with a prayer, however vague and tenuous, that in spite of the absence of virgins and angels, wise men and shepherds, we might still be a witness to the birth of all love. We gather as ready as we'll ever be for this story of faith to unfold. God of our life and light, thank you for coming this night to us. Thanks for touching all heaven and earth with your splendor. In every corner of the world, shine this night with your peace. In every corner of our hearts, shine this night with your grace. Amen.
Our first reading this morning is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 9, uh, 2, verses 6 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who have lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord, Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her.
Our third reading is from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Watch a five-year-old rip open a Christmas gift and find socks instead of a video game? <laughs> Do you know that look when the box is opened and he finds that it contains underwear instead of the latest Shopkins doll? The best you can hope for is that your little darling will casually toss the box aside and pick up another one. More likely you'll get weeping and gnashing of teeth or protest like, but I wanted a toy. And at that point, good parents will scold, well, that's not nice. Say thank you to your Aunt Emma. And the kid will give you that you got to be kidding look on his or her face. And there will be a rolling of the eyes and then a half-hearted, yeah, thanks. Of course, we adults aren't always paragons of etiquette when it comes to Christmas gifts either. One year, my very Catholic sister-in-law gave me a set of note cards 
with a drawing on the front of a robed figure scowling darkly and holding a sword in his hand. When she saw my confusion, she said, don't you know who that is? And I said, please don't tell me this is supposed to be Jesus. She said, no, no, it's St. Paul. You know, the Pope has declared this the year of St. Paul. Well, I started to remonstrate that we hell-bound Protestants like myself don't keep up with the Pope's, Pope's pronouncements. But I thanked her with all the enthusiasm of that five-year-old I mentioned earlier gazing at the socks. The only time I ever used those note cards afterwards was when I wanted to scare somebody. I should have followed my granddaddy's example and thanked her profusely and then quietly put those note cards where they would never see the light of day again. When my mother and my aunt were cleaning out my granddaddy's house after his death, they found drawers full of shirts and sweaters and other gifts that he had gushed over when he received them and then stuffed them in a drawer without even removing them from the cellophane. There's a right way to receive a gift, and there's a wrong way to receive a gift. When Peter Gomes was on the faculty at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, he would often get invited to preach at little country churches around the area, and they always tried to give him an honorarium for his trouble, but he would look around at the shabbiness of their meeting place and say, oh no, I couldn't accept that. You, you keep it for yourselves. One church passed the hat and presented him with a few dollars in nickels and quarters in a paper sack. And he demurred, no, 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 you keep it, you keep it. At breakfast the next morning, he told his landlady about it, surely that she, she would, knowing surely that she would pat him on the back for his modesty, but she scowled at him and said, young man, those people needed to give you that money more than you needed to receive it. You need to learn how to be a generous receiver. There's a right way to receive a gift and a wrong way to receive a gift. The right way is to be a generous receiver. Now at Christmas time, we're fond of saying that Jesus is a gift to us. We claim that that's the reason why we exchange gifts. So is there a right way to receive the gift of Jesus? and a wrong way to receive the gift of Jesus? Sure there is. Some of us are pros at receiving Jesus the wrong way. We act like that aforementioned five-year-old and complain that the Jesus who calls us to follow him, even when it's inconvenient, even when it's countercultural, is not what we were expecting. Or we act like my granddaddy. We make gleeful noises about the gift of life in Christ and then relegate discipleship to one of those items that's out of sight, out of mind. Or we might act like I did with those note cards. Well, I appreciate the sentiment, but following Jesus is beneath me. When my daughters were in high school, we had a German exchange student about their age who came and stayed with us for a couple of weeks. Her name was Babel, and she brought us the gift of a cuckoo clock all the way from the Black Forest in Germany. I've put that clock up every place I have ever lived since, and I've even pointed it out to people who came to visit. I've never been able to regulate the pendulum just right, and so over the years I've tended to neglect that clock. Recently it got a kink in one of the chains, and Penny took it to have it repaired, but I've ignored that clock for so long now that I keep forgetting to wind it up and actually let it tell time. I'm glad I lost touch with Babel over the years. I would hate for her to come into my house and see her gift so forgotten and neglected. I received her gift badly. I haven't been a generous receiver. God forbid I should do that with the gift of Jesus in my life. Such a precious gift should be nurtured and celebrated like a clock. It should be more than just something I show off for friends and family. It should order the comings and goings of my life. 
You and I should be generous receivers of the gift of Jesus. Our lives should reflect not just the sweet baby Jesus cooing in the manger, but also the Christ who said, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. As well as the Christ who said, You can't serve two masters. If our lives reminded others of Jesus, then we have received him correctly. We have become generous receivers. Frederick Buechner tells about a friend of his who was a pastor in an Episcopal congregation. And at Christmas time, they, just like we did last Sunday, had their annual children's Christmas pageant. The plywood manger was down in front of the chancel steps, and there was Mary in a blue mantle and Joseph in a cotton beard. The wise men were there with a handful of shepherds and, of course, the Christ child there resting beatifically in the straw. The pastor read the Christmas story out loud, punctuated at appropriate places by Christmas carols, and it all went like clockwork until it came time for the arrival of the heavenly host of angels. Each angel had been sitting out in the congregation in costume with his or her parents, And at the right moment, they were all supposed to come forward and gather around the manger and say together that line from Luke's gospel, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And that's what they did, except that there were so many angels there that year, there was a fair amount of crowding and pushing and shoving and jockeying for a position And one angel, a little girl about nine years old and smaller than most of the others, had gotten shoved to the outer fringes of the heavenly host, and she couldn't see what was going on at the manger. And so the other angels joined their voices right on cue, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And then there was a momentary pause, and that little nine-year-old angel shouted, let Jesus show congregation sat back in silence and stunned. They were overwhelmed by the words now that were ringing in their ears. And there was supposed to be a lot more Christmas program that day, but the pastor, in probably one of the wisest choices he ever made in his whole career, got up, said the benediction, and dismissed the crowd. Let Jesus show, the little girl said. There really wasn't anything more to say. What's the right way to receive the gift of Jesus? Let Jesus show. Let Jesus show. Let Jesus show.
our church has had the tradition of giving our Christmas Eve offerings to a special project. None of the money stays here. And so this year, we have three different projects going, and our hope is to raise $9,000. We want to give $3,000 to uh, the Community Crisis Center to help them buy a stove that is much needed uh, to serve the people there. Nationally, we want to give money to a program called the, the Navajo Water Project, and um, that will provide a well for a family that doesn't have running water. In fact, 40% of the people in, um, the, on the Native American reservations do not have running water. We find that appalling. And third, the third program is an international one that will work with Family Village Farm in Kapati, India, and it takes the um, children who are abandoned on the street and the destitute elderly and puts them together in family units and provides a safe place for them. So we ask that you consider tonight really digging deep into your pockets and giving generously and that uh, you will consider all the good that your money can give. In this time when we give so many gifts to others, this is a time for us to give to those who really need it as well. Um, in addition to uh, being able to use cash or check, um, you'll notice that there is a card in the pocket, the pew pocket, that allows you to give electronically through Tithely. Or we have um, Apple Square at the back if you'd like to use your credit card. Uh, just go to the table in the back and you may do it that way. So as you prayerfully consider that, let's pause to pray. Oh God, we come before the child to offer our gifts and the question lingers in our heart. What can I give him? What gift is worthy? How much is enough? Where is the need the greatest? What can we do? Let us stretch to give more than we planned and let us give our whole selves in gratitude for the greatest gift this world has known, Christ our Lord. Amen.
In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of a great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. Tonight, as we celebrate the birth of Christ, you are invited to come to the refreshing table of the Lord. There has always been a place set for you at this table. The table is open to all, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome to commune with us. Tonight, we will be taking communion by intinction, and that means that there will be little pieces of bread that you will pick up, you will dip that in the chalice of grape juice and then eat it immediately and go back to your seat. 
will be coming down the two center aisles, forming uh, two separate lines, and then after you have taken communion, you'll go back to your seat by the outer aisle. We would also ask that you allow the choir to commune first tonight. Let's pray together. Gathering around the table as we celebrate new life born, and we remember so many stories shared around tables. Tables where bread is broken and cup is poured out, where families gather and generations share, where stories are remembered and refined and reshaped. Gathering around the table on this holy night, we remember the story of the sacred daring to share our life, the story of the holy donning human flesh and dwelling among us, the story that is at once both ethereal and earthly. Gathering around the table on this Christmas night, we break the bread and remember the paradox that it is in our brokenness that we become whole. We fill this cup and remember the abundance discovered in each new sharing of our sacred stories. Together around the table we pray, come Holy Spirit, come. Bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking that our eyes might be opened, that we might recognize the Spirit rising in our midst indeed in one another. Come, Holy Spirit, come. We pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray and continues to teach us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be. The scriptures tell us that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed that he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat for this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after supper he took the cup and he gave thanks again. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you. Drink ye all of it. These, my friends, are the gifts of God for all, every last one of the people of God. Amen. Come, for all things are ready. Please join me in our prayer of gratitude as printed in your bulletin. We are filled with joy, for we have heard good news of great joy. We are filled with love, for we have tasted the sign of God's great love. We are filled with hope, for the angels still sing in our world, and there is light for us to follow. Amen. Tonight's fifth reading is from the book of John, the first chapter, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. And the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. 
He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. It was in the world, and the world came into being through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory. The glory of the of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. silent night and let Jesus show.
And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.